Hello, welcome back to Properly Freelance Podcast. I'm Jenny Elborn, and today I am in conversation with Richard Neal. Hi, Richard. Hi. Um, I'm going to let you tell us a little bit about yourself in your own words before we go on to today's topic, which is how to work effectively. So I know you as a filmmaker, but I've got a feeling you may have some other strings to your bow. I'm a yeah, I'm a freelance journalist, um, filmmaker, sometimes photographer. And do other bits and pieces occasionally, but most of my most of my work's either written uh, ju- written journalism or filmmaking. So we met through the Impact Hub, where you used to be a member, but are no longer. Yes, yeah, so I've been I've been freelancing for about nine years now. Mm-hmm. So I've gone through a few different office places. I spent a couple of years uh, working from home and working from cafes and. Just trying to find a different place to work each day, and after two years, I think that kind of that broke me. I just got one day. I just I was working in a in a cafe in Brixton, and I just thought I've had enough. I need an office, and I'd done a bit of research, and I just walked over the road to an office space in Brixton called Piano Club, and signed up that day. And they they said, um, when do you want to start? I said, I just looked at the desk and was like, can no. I start now? <laughs> And so I started that afternoon, and I was there for about four years. Four years, oh. and then that closed down. And I tried working without an office space again for a couple of months, and it drove me mad yeah. much faster than it had the We've first all time. Been there. Um, and then I found Impact Hub. Yeah, and you were there for a while, and you were sort of squirreling away on the top floor, and I didn't really know what you were doing, except you seemed to be working very hard. Um, <laughs> And for today's topic, you suggested how to work effectively, which is great because this is something I could do with some advice <laughs> on. <laughs> and I mean, it sounds like you might be like something of an expert in this. You've been kind of reading well, around it. and It's kind of force of circumstance in that I'm a freelancer and if I'm not working effectively, that's having a direct impact on me. So I have spent quite a lot of my time over the years working out how to get yeah. incrementally better at being effective. It's one of the things people talk about the most, I think, um, when I talk to maybe friends who you know work 9 to 5 in offices, they say, oh, I couldn't work from home, um, I would be so distracted, I wouldn't be effective, I wouldn't get anything done. Yeah. So it's, I think it's a really important topic, actually, and it'll be totally universal to anyone that's suddenly finding themselves in charge of their own time, is how on earth do you Yeah, that's definitely, definitely true for me in the working from home, working not from home division. Mm. Um, I can work effectively from home, but it tends to have a limited lifespan, like I could I can maybe do it for a few weeks, and then I just, it just starts to drive me mad. Yeah. And I don't think that's, that's not just because there are temptations to be distracted, which there are, but it's also about having that separation of where you're working and where you're living the rest uh-huh. of your life, which I think is really healthy. Yeah. So I'm definitely more effective if I have somewhere else to go and work. Yeah. I mean, most of us in London seem to live in quite small properties and there's nothing worse, I think, (laughs) than, you know, you're just trying to do something relaxing. You're trying to have your dinner or watch the TV or even, you know, if you're in a house share and you're the only space you have to yourself is your bedroom, then you're literally trying to go to sleep and your work is there. You know, there's a desk with a pile of stuff on it. Your office is three yards away from where you're sleeping. Oh, I don't think it's good, is it, for mental health? I mean, if you have to do, sometimes I end up doing like a 17 or 18 hour day and that can work from home because literally I'm getting out of bed, walking to my desk, starting work because things are so intense for a while that I, so I've recently been crowdfunding and that's kind of been a, a double shift job. So I have been working a about 16 hours a day for I've the last few weeks. I've seen some of your social media output. It's quite impressive what it's, you've managed um, to do. It's very hard work, and it is quite hard to maintain effective working for 16 hours, but there are some circumstances where you just need to be online for that amount of time. Mm-hmm. And I was working with a social media manager in LA and ended up working a lot of LA hours. So I probably ended up working around midday till 4 a.m., which is definitely not what I would recommend. Oh. That was six or seven days a week. That's not the best way to work effectively, but if you need to be on all the time for to raise awareness of what you're doing, which is yeah. I'm making a film, so I was crowdfunding it. 
it became necessary for a short period of time. But yeah, that kind part. of feels like I've gone away from good working effectively practices, and I'm now getting back into back into sure, practicing sure. what I preach. So, what what do you preach? What do you think constitutes working effectively? How um, I think when I started when I started looking into it, I read something by an organisation called Little Green Dots. I don't know if they're still putting out stuff on effective working, but they had something called How to Be a Morning Person. Oh, I need to read that. I, <laughs> I, had, I had no interest in becoming a morning person because I, I'm, kind of, I'm pretty convinced I'm not a morning person. Mm. But I read it anyway, and what I took away from it was not really how to be a morning person, but how to decide what I wanted from a day. Because that was the whole principle, that mm. if you decide what you want from a day, then you become motivated, and that enables you to get up at the time that you want to get up. So it doesn't have to be early in the morning. I think there's something called, there's a, there's a podcast I've seen called The 5am Miracle, and I'm not listening to it. It's like, I, I have no interest <laughs> in a miracle like us? that starts at 5am. Like, <laughs> I can miss that miracle. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so focusing... give, me, give me an example of, like you're saying, what, decide what you want to get from a day what yeah. kind of things are they that well uh, you might want to get from a day the first thing it said to do was write write down what your ideal day is so how much time you would like to spend on different things how much time you'd like to spend seeing your friends or exercising or creative thinking or strategic thinking or doing the tasks you have to do and i did looking at a day how would you ideally structure mm. that now that seems like a really obvious place to start, but it's probably something that gets overlooked quite a lot. I guess if you do that, time. then you add it up and you can see how many hours you need to be awake for, which is not my, that's yeah, not I mean, my starting point. Yeah, if it's 20 point. odd, then that could be difficult. <laughs> my starting point is usually more like, how many hours do I want to be asleep for? <laughs> and then how many hours have I got left? Because I really do value sleep a lot. I, um, I think it focuses you on the bits of the day that, you, that you're that you really enthusiastic about. And then that helps you be motivated through the bits of the day that you're less enthusiastic about because you know you need to get that stuff done mm. in order to have that time. So it did it did focus me in the morning because instead of thinking, oh, I'm getting up at 7 o'clock because I've got an article to write by 12, I'd be thinking, I'm getting up at 7 o'clock because I want to do half an hour's writing before breakfast and then go to work and work for a couple of hours, but then I can go swimming at 12 o'clock yeah. and... Yeah, so it's having it, a commitment to those things that no one else is going to force you to do. Because yeah. if you've got a meeting at 12 o'clock, you'd get there. But it's different if you're trying to go for a swim at 12 o'clock. Because, and I, I actually do that ex very example. I do this a lot because there's a swimming pool right next to the hub. I often bring my bag with my swimming kit in it with the, with the aim of going swimming at 12 o'clock or whenever. Yeah. And then I just take my swimming kit home again. <laughs> and I, because I haven't, I haven't worked effectively enough to make that time and I haven't been committed yeah. enough to that to doing that thing and you can actually turn that psychology to every part of your day as well so it's not it works more easily for the bits of the day that you know you're going to love mm. like if you want to meet a friend for coffee and you want to make time for that then obviously helps if you get up and get other stuff out of the way um but you can look at all of the things that you need to do from a this is something i want to do perspective if you just turn turn the mental framing of what you're doing from oh I have to do this to I want to do this because then I can do this or then it will be finished and I'll be happy that's that it's finished or mm. because it's fulfilling work and I've chosen to do it therefore I do want to do it yeah which so, should be the case in some be... sense when you're freelancing you should be able to do that with everything exactly I think yeah. I I've found that a lot more in my kind of more recent work where I feel like I'm properly freelancing because I'm hardly ever working for somebody else like pretty much everything I'm doing I actually genuinely feel like I'm working for myself whereas if you're doing something that's self-employed but essentially for someone else it can yeah. be very difficult to kind of pick up that psychology and I suppose it's about remembering that you did make that decision you did choose for that to be part of your portfolio or part of your life structure that helps you have the rest of the life that, that you mm -hmm. want to plan yeah. so it is all kind of for you, even if you're doing it for someone else or you're on a deadline. I mean, I'm constantly on deadlines as a journalist, mm. um, but I have some agency over what I'm writing, so I shouldn't be yeah. dismal about the fact that I've got to do it. I, I definitely 
relate to what you say about um, having, say, blocks of time for the creative side of your work, because I also do a job where I have a mixture of kind of creative and, I guess, administrative or production side things to sort out. Um, and I find it really hard to block out that time for creative work. And I find like I need to be in a, I need to be in a different space to do it. I'm, I actually sometimes, I do most of my admin side work from the hub, but I maybe will go to a cafe or something or just f put myself in a different space if I want to try and spend a block of time on the actual creative work. So for me, that usually is kind of actually reading stuff to come up with ideas for workshops or adapting or writing scripts based on stuff that's come out of my workshops and it's so hard to find the time and space for that which yeah. is crazy because actually a lot of the time all the other work that I'm doing is in order to enable that creative stuff to happen and yet I end up squeezing that into you know half an hour on a Friday afternoon because it still hasn't been done yeah no I, it's interesting I, I used to I, I still do when I can there's a column in the Guardian weekend magazine called this column will change your life oh, Oliver, Oliver, Berkman? Oliver Berkman yeah and I used to read that every week and did now, it ever now change I read your life it. I think some of the stuff <laughs> some of the stuff in there is is brilliant but one of the myths it exposed was about um, f freelancers and creatives like to think that they don't need to structure any of their time that, that the whole benefit of being freelance is that you can just do anything whenever you want and that's brilliant and it turns out that that isn't necessarily the most effective way of being freelance and being creative. Well, it's true, you can do anything whenever you want. But if you want your work to have an audience or get finished, then you've, as well as doing the creative thing that you want to do, you've also got to do all this other stuff to give your creative thing an outlet or funding or yeah. a structure, a framework around it. Well, it also takes a lot of brain power. Uh, ironically, it takes a lot of brain power inventing a new day every single day. So if you're getting up and you don't have an office, mm -hmm. so you've got a decision to make about where to work, and it can be any cafe or any bar or any anywhere, that's already brain power that you you're using to decide where to work. And then if you're not already decided what time you're going to start work, then it doesn't really matter. So you pick a time to start work, but that, again, that's and it, every decision you're making is using up resources that you could be spending on your creative yeah. so work. It's, called, it's decision fatigue. I've heard this talked about in kind of psychological terms as well. And I totally get that. Sometimes I'll get to lunchtime and I will feel like I've made so many decisions already that day. And a lot of the time I might have made, you know, I might have made dozens of decisions, none of which I've spoken to anyone about. A lot of them are sort of, I'm just getting on with something or I've maybe had an email conversation with somebody and as you say, I've had to decide, you know, whether to get out of bed, what time to start working. And you, you're literally deciding these things, aren't you? That you start to go a bit stir crazy. And I might get to lunchtime and the decision of what to have for lunch is just too much. <laughs> well, and I'll end up eating, you know, beans on toast four days in a row because I just can't cope with the mental power that that yeah. takes. The flip side of freelancing is that no one is taking decisions out of your hands. Yeah. And people obviously freelance because... They like it that way, I think. I, I like it that way. But if you're doing everything all of the time, yeah, it can be that can be exhausting. And and actually, in relation to that, you one thing that I find useful is to say, right, actually, I am going to sort of plan my lunches for the week on Sunday or whatever. Obviously, I can change my mind if I don't yeah. like on Wednesday. If it turns out I don't like the thing I plan to have, but I find it easier to do some of that sort of thinking outside of time that I'm trying to work. Yeah. And then have some of those decisions sort of already thought through and yeah. it just doesn't tax the brain so much. But I think the other reason why freelancers are perhaps sometimes reluctant to set a timetable for working or have regular regular hours is partly the rebellion of I don't have to have re regular hours, therefore I won't. But it's also maybe something to do with the fluctuation of workload. And I think that's possibly a bit fallacious as well because... If you do have a structured time that you're doing your work, then you'll find that you're in work. And if it's a slightly easier week in terms of workflow, you've suddenly got the space to do the thing that you, you're really excited about doing. But if you hadn't turned up and there's no work that you have to do for somebody, you just end up doing something else. Whereas if you've got this routine, it enables a, a structure for creative thinking to happen, I think. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I find myself kind of treating most of my weekdays as work days even though sometimes I might be only getting paid for two or three of them in terms of 
work that I've actually got lined up with clients or funding that I've got to manage certain projects that I'm working on. But I will still go somewhere and sit myself down and say this is my working time because there is always stuff to do and sometimes that's when the creative stuff happens. Yeah. I think it's, it's kind of that well-known thing really of you, the stuff you have to do will expand to fill the time that you have. And sometimes I find that a bit depressing because I might think, oh, actually, I'm only really getting paid for four days this week. Why have I worked five or six or seven? <laughs> but on the other hand, it does help to have that structure and to not be having to... I think my default, my default decision is I get up and I go to work because if my default was the other way, then I'd be having to persuade myself to do it every single day. Yeah. And actually, I do love what I do. That's, you know, that's a great thing, isn't it? To yeah. be able to say, well, I'm doing this even though I'm not getting paid by the minute for every minute of it because I actually do want to do it anyway. Yeah. And the, yeah. the time management techniques that they have to be rocket science, they can just be, okay, these are my office hours. Um, there's one, have you heard of Pomodoro's? Don't so, po think so. It sounds like a pizza. Pomodoro, <laughs> well, yeah, it sounds like a pizza because Pomodoro is Italian for tomato. Um, and is he also a person? No, he's not a person. He's a um, he or she is a is a timer, so you know oh, the little okay. alarm clocks that look like look like tomatoes. Oh, the, the use, are they um, designed for kitchens? And yeah. there's a bu yeah, there's a yeah. buzzer on them. Okay. And so a pomodoro, for for whatever reason, there's obviously research gone into this. A pomodoro is is a span of time during which you can work effectively without your brain fatiguing. Ah, uh, okay. And that is according to research, 25 minutes. So under this theory of Pomodoro's, this practice of Pomodoro's, a Pomodoro is 25 minutes long. And after 25 minutes, you take a five minute break and you do three Pomodoro's. So three sets of 25 minutes with a five minute break. Mm -hmm. And that's an hour and a half. And then you take a longer break, 15, 20, 30 minutes. And then you start another set of three Pomodoro's. Oh, I don't know if I could be that regimented. I know what would happen. I, I did have an app on my computer at one point which was supposed to like flash something up to make you take a screen break, but it was far too easy to override it and I'd always be like, oh, I'm just going to finish this email and then I just wouldn't take a screen break. <laughs> I wasn't very good at that. I've, I find it absolutely life-changing. Do you do it sort of really religiously? I've done it for three or four years. Do you actually use a small tomato-shaped alarm clock? Um, <laughs> I probably should do, shouldn't I? I? I use a timer on my mobile phone. Okay. Or I start on a round number. So if it's nine o'clock, I'll know that at 9.25, I'm going to stop for five minutes and mm -hmm. at 9.30, I'm going to start again. And you swear by it? Yeah, I think it's amazing. Um, because it's it does enable you to focus because you know you're not going to exhaust yourself because you know you're not going to focus forever. Mm. But you, you, you also commit to not being distracted for 25 minutes. So during those 25 minutes, my phone is normally on airplane mode so my phone's not going to ring i'm not going to go on the i'm not going to go online i'm not going to message anybody i'm not going to receive any messages so that work that you're doing tends to be the more kind of creative side stuff and it's not like a technique for because i mean i could imagine doing that and being like for the next 25 minutes i'm going to reply to emails <laughs> which kind of is so bitty and actually is so responsive to someone else that i don't know no, if it has the same value as I going mean, yeah no that's absolutely a valid thing to do with the 25 minutes it, in fact, it just means that you're replying to emails for 25 minutes rather than mm. checking email every eight minutes for eight hours. Yeah. So that And that is a much more effective yeah. way of dealing with email. So setting once, twice a day when you do deal with email is another way to manage yeah. your time. One thing that I have done on that front is um, I trialed for a little while. And I still do this when I feel like I've got a big backlog of email and a lot of responsive work is happening. I don't look at my emails in the mornings. I spend the morning going through my own to-do list or whatever jobs I need to do, some of which might be answer an email, but I don't sit and go through my inbox in order to kind of try and clear it until the afternoon because what I'll then find is that some of those things have resolved themselves because I did them in the morning when they were my priority. Yeah. Some of them have resolved themselves because they weren't my priority and someone else has kind of dealt with it. Um and I don't feel like my whole, sometimes, you know, I used to just feel like I would have so much email coming in and everything I was doing was to please someone else or kind of bat the ball back into their side of the court. And, you know, I could get to four o'clock in the afternoon and I wouldn't have done anything except respond to email. And I think it's really easy to basically feel like you're working for someone else mm. 
even when you're supposed to be working for yourself. Well, and every time like you that. respond, it can create another message that you then respond to, which yeah. creates another message that you then respond to. But the way you that you're saying you're dealing with that is is brilliant. Like it's really good practice to start the day knowing what your priorities are and to do them. I I find it I find that one of the more difficult things to implement. Because as a journalist, I'm somewhat reliant on the flow of information that comes to me in email. So if I leave that for a few hours, I might have missed something important or mm. an opportunity to write something. So what kind of um, what kind of to-do list do you have? What format does your to-do list take? I'm interested in this from an effective working perspective. Um, I, yeah, I think it's easy to um, prioritise the wrong things when... Like people think, uh, oh, it's really important that my to-do list is on Evernote or Trello or a piece of paper. Or I, I think the decision on ha- what kind of to-do list to use is completely irrelevant. Oh, oh interesting. Because um, people agonise over this, don't yeah, they? Yeah, I know. And I, 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 <laughs> but think what that, do you use? I think that's a waste do you, do of energy. Have, do you have lots of different ones? Or yeah, I, I usually use, I usually use um, pen and paper. Mm. Um, but I think it's much more important to know why you're putting things on your to-do list and whether they're actually important mm. because there's um you get a certain dopamine hit from ticking things off a to-do list and that leads you a to put things on the to-do list that you know are easy and you're going to be able to tick off or b to look at your to-do list and deliberately pick the things that are going to be easy so you can tick them off <laughs> That's so true. So if you've got five things on your to-do list and you tick three of them off it looks like you've done 60% of the work yeah. You probably haven't. You probably left the two things that were the hardest. Oh, totally. I think I'm guilty of this. So I, at the moment, I use something called Asana, which is an online task management type thing. And I don't know if it's the best one for me to be using, but it's the one I, I thought I'd give it a go. And then I put all of my stuff on it. And now I can't be bothered to try a different one because actually it takes a lot of effort to right. work out whether something's right for you or not. So yeah. anyway, I've been using it for a good, probably, yeah, two, maybe two years. It's, it's pretty good. Um, and I, I do prefer it to a pen and paper list because it allows you to put all your tasks in and if you, at the end of the day, if there's something that I haven't done, I can just reallocate it to a different day and I know that it's sort of still there because I, I think I do have an awful memory for remembering to do things that I've sort of committed to doing. So for me, I feel like I do need to get them written down. But some days... I will look at my to-do list and either I haven't had time to look at it all day so I just look at it right at the end of the day or I kind of look at it and panic <laughs> and my priority becomes see which things I can move to a different day <laughs> and and the, the act of ticking things off my list is simply an act of moving them to different days yeah. and as soon as I've that's, cleared it I feel this great sense of achievement even though strategy. I might not have done anything at all. Strategic thinking at work. <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe, uh, I'm, maybe I'm not being very productive. Yeah, productivity and ticking things off to-do lists are definitely two different things. Um, have you heard the expression, eat the frog? I have heard the expression, eat the frog, yeah. So so that's like getting the the worst thing that you have to do in the day, you should do it first, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to do. It does feel good yeah. if you manage to do it. I think I'm quite lucky. I don't, I rarely, there's rarely something on my list where I'm like, oh God, I really don't want to do this. The things that I struggle to do are more likely to be those kind of, creative type tasks so maybe i need to think of those as my frogs yeah like it's not that it's difficult it's not a, it's like a chocolate frog it's not a horrible slimy <laughs> difficult one it's just one that i want to i need to give myself time to enjoy eat the chocolate okay. frog <laughs> maybe a frog is just anything that you're likely to procrastinate over for whatever for whatever reason it doesn't need to be a horrible thing that you need to do mm. so i mean sometimes people Human psychology is such that people are sometimes scared of achieving the thing they want to achieve, and like mm. success, fear of success rather than fear of failure, yeah. which means that you put off the thing that you know is likely to have the most positive impact, mm. either because you're scared that maybe it won't, or there's all sorts of complicated explanations yeah. why this happens. But well, I've I wonder seen that. as well. I wonder whether I put off the more creative tasks because they are the more challenging and stretching and they're the things which I'm going to be more sort of personally sensitive about if they if I don't get a good response to them whereas all the other stuff which is kind of what I think about when I think about being organized and working effectively you know that's all the kind of admin making stuff happen I know I could do that stuff I know that it's going to contribute to my projects going well 
and I think certainly for the first sort of seven, eight years of my working life, I got a real reputation for just being really good at getting loads of stuff done really quickly. And I've got this, I've got a slightly weird relationship with the whole idea of effective working because I didn't like the fact that people thought that was my key skill was that I was very sort of efficient and productive. Um, and I think maybe I would quite like them to have valued my creative skills more. Okay. So maybe... But then you wouldn't have had the opportunity to practice your creative skills without all of this brilliant and effective decision making and implementation, surely. Yeah, maybe. maybe. I, I wouldn't knock it. <laughs> no, it's very important. Yeah, it's totally, it's essential to yeah. being a freelancer. And I, and I don't mind all of that stuff now. I'm quite happy to be a productive person and get on with stuff and do it as a freelancer because I'm working for myself. And it's like you were saying before, everything that I do, I do in some sense want to do because I understand why it needs to be done much harder when you're working yeah. for someone else and you know someone else is telling you why it needs to be done yeah i mean it all boils down to knowing why you're working on something mm. at any given moment and i'm gonna I'll come back to pomodoros this is another reason why pomodoros is so brilliant it should be pomodori really shouldn't it but Pomod let's call need to find the plural yeah yeah pomodoros um because every what i find is that i'll work on something for 25 minutes and then i'll stop and I'll probably go for a, a walk, two or three minutes. I mean, that's we all know that moving around is is good for your mind, good for your body, mm. good for your productivity. But we're not always good at doing it. You shouldn't just be sitting there. So that's another way of kind of stimulating yourself is moving around every twenty five minutes. But what I tend to find is that my brain will free itself from what I'm actually working on, and then I'll have a I'll have a productive thought. It could just be one thought. I'd be like, oh. This is what I should be doing, yeah, and that will change everything about 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 my day. It, it might be the inspiration of a structure for an article that I'm that I'm writing, or there's something in the back of my mind. There's a problem that I'm working on. If I give myself that five minute break, I'll I'll very often solve that problem without even realizing. Yeah, I'm not I'll sure if I've ever had a really good idea while I'm actually staring at a screen. <laughs> Well, It'll no, because you, to find you're, out, you're it? totally absorbed with whatever is in front of you, which is which is a good thing for a period of time. But if you just carry on, if you carry that on through your day, then you're never going to find out what thoughts you might have had if you'd just taken those <laughs> brief spaces at regular intervals during the day. I mean, this is this is why I really I really like this stretch of working, and also you don't get fatigued. I mean, mm. I have I have a colleague who's working in in the same office as, as I do. And he says um, he works till 5.30, more or less. And he says that if he works just another, he'll see me working till like 10, 11 at night sometimes. Um, do you real... not find that tiring? Because I used to see you doing that a lot and think, no, well, I... you must be exhausted. But no. this, you swear by the Pomodoros and they keep you going for yeah. 12 um, hours. Shifts. So he would say if he, if he just did one extra hour, he would notice because he'd be exhausted. Yeah, I would. But then he gets he goes into work, sits at his desk for four hours, mm. takes lunch, comes back, sits at his desk for four hours. If I did that, I'd be totally destroyed by yeah. six in the evening. Yeah. But I, I don't yeah. feel that. And if I've just taken an hour and a half's break at between 6 and 7.30, and I need to do another four hours work, then I, that's fine. Yeah. I think you must be doing something right, because I was so impressed with your fundraisers that you organised recently, because you started um, putting feelers out for those, and you were trying to organise them with about two weeks' notice. Well, they... And that's the kind of thing that I'd, I organised a fundraiser <laughs> earlier this year, and I needed six months, honestly. I just I couldn't bring myself to the take gigs. something on. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was quite stressful, and like I said, I was working, working very long days, because I... I, so I did a comedy course myself a few months ago, so I'd done some stand-up comedy, made some friends in the stand-up amateur stand-up comedy world in so London. So you knew that you had the contacts and the resources to get yeah. it done. Um, I had fear of failure and fear of fear of success at the same time. Like mm. part of me thought, yeah, I can probably pull this off, and then was like, oh my god, it's quite scary. Putting and you on ended the... up doing two fundraisers, yeah, because put, put on two you events, put out so many feelers that. Yeah, Not more came back to you than you even were hoping I for. I think the afternoon of the first show, I was still establishing who was who was going to be performing. <laughs> um, I I got to the venue about an hour and a quarter before the event started, and I I didn't know who was going to be on in what order. I didn't know what I was going to say because I hadn't had time to even think about that, and I was going to be comparing for the first time ever. I 
I emceed both both of the events and How I did it go? Uh, went really well. Yeah. Um, Do you want to say I, what you're fundraising for? Because I didn't ask you at the beginning about your yeah. About so your my, film. My, my main project at the moment is uh, a documentary about the wheelchair basketball team in South Sudan. So South Sudan is the world's newest country, formed in 2011, um, and I've been going there since 2011. And for the last six years, I've been making a film about the national wheelchair basketball team. And that's currently in production phase five, I think, with another one planned for next year. So I've been crowdfunding for the production of that film. Is there any information about the film online somewhere, if anybody's interested? Um, find out more? It will partly depend on when this podcast goes out. Um, but January, <laughs> maybe? <laughs> So in January, I will have been crowdfunding on um, chuffed.org, which is um, a crowdfunding platform for socially conscious projects that um, are designed to have a positive impact on the world. Also based at the Impact Hub. Also based at the Impact <laughs> Hub. Um, it's like a tiny world. So it's possible that my project will still be on there, because even after the fundraising period, you can you can leave your projects on there for people who are interested in contributing. So. Um, the film's called Lions and Tigers. So any listeners who are interested in supporting the film can find Lions and Tigers on chuffed.org. I mean, we definitely have a lot of listeners by now. I, I don't know. But also they're definitely all full of money because they're freelancers. Absolutely. And, you know, yeah, and they're using their time really effectively. <laughs> <laughs> don't, I would say don't try and listen to podcasts while you're working, actually. Because <laughs> I have tried once or twice... And I either don't do the work or I don't listen to the podcast. I'll sort of get to the end of it and be like, I don't know what happened in that podcast. I, I find it very hard to concentrate on two things at once. That, I'm glad you. I'm glad you raised the subject um, because <laughs> multitasking is a, is a hugely extolled virtue, and it's an absolute disaster of disastrous way of being productive. Yeah, monotasking is indisputably the best way to be productive. Um, yeah, focusing on one thing. I'm so guilty of that. My husband's been away recently, and it means that I there's no one to tell me to clean up the flat. So I use that as an excuse to kind of multitask to a ridiculous level. Like <laughs> I have sort of a table with post-its all over it, and I've got my laptop out, and I've got sort of I leave things out to remind me what I'm doing. But it means that I feel like I'm in the middle of all of those things all the time. Right. It's yeah, it's a disaster. So it's good that he's just come back, and I've and had to tidy. I've had to tidy everything away. So you work at home and in the office. I work almost exclusively from the hub, but I because I don't have a I don't have storage or a fixed desk. I have to to and fro with everything. Oh, I see. Right. Um, and so quite often I will leave when I get home in the evenings. I'll like you know take my laptop out and I'll leave myself a little note about something that I need to do tomorrow or whatever. It's that kind of you know, it's communicating the next thing to yourself, isn't it? Yeah. I think if I had a physical desk in the hub, then I would be leaving post-its all over that. Yeah. Just those little reminders, because partly it's because I don't want to have to open my phone every time and put something into my yeah into a list and look at a screen again. But it, I've just got physical stuff all over the place. You're showing me your hand. Yeah, is, listen, is that I, your to-do list? I, our listeners can't uh, can't see this, obviously, but yeah, I, I always have one two or three things written on my hand it's kind of in is that a red pen i can't really and those it. are well it's in whatever pen that that i have handy at the time but it's the one or two things that are the absolute priority for me and i'll write them on my hand see mine would be constantly shifting <laughs> my hand would just be a complete mess but yeah, it's really you know that's because i just, obviously like, don't have a clear a enough 20... idea of what my priorities are yeah absolutely are these long term goals or do no, you rewrite them every day no that's just something that I need to do that, that you, day you wash your hands quite often yeah Yeah, I wash my hands quite often yeah. <laughs> that would be a terribly unhygienic recommendation if you were telling people <laughs> to just write their life goals on their hand I have a question which is can you be organised and effective in this modern day world without technology or is that kind of playing a crucial role because I feel like all the tech that's available to us is one of the things that enables us to have this freelance life. And for me, it does help with sort of being organised and effective. But I also feel like it's constantly demanding that I keep up with other people and it doesn't necessarily make me feel like I'm 
getting more stuff done in a way that gives me more free time because I actually just feel like every time I do something something comes back to me and we're just all kind of clambering to keep up with this ridiculously fast-paced technological life. What kind of media are you talking about? So the, obviously there's, there's social media, there's email, there's all, sort, all sorts of means of communication these days. Yeah, so I guess I'm talking about email and fast communication, but also the fact that kind of organising stuff, I kind of feel like organising is reorganising. Like if something's well planned, if I am in the early stages of planning something, I'll have it all sort of planned out on a, like a document of some kind, which is very easy to then edit and mm -hmm. change when the plan changes. And in a sense, that is giving us this kind of level of flexibility that just means we end up doing more and more and more work because we're constant we're sort of amenable to constantly replanning things and I just wonder how people would have done similar stuff years and years and years ago I mean my dad um worked for BT for his whole career and he you know tells me about you know the times when they didn't work on a computer and people there'd be this little mail boy that would come every day and put an envelope on his desk with the day's mail in it and that was you know how they communicated right. things and part of me thinks well that would be really nice and I would maybe feel more productive because I just wouldn't have so much stuff coming at me all the time to yeah to do well yeah I mean you're highlighting the difference between productivity and busyness aren't you yeah so you can be busy constantly and mm. not be productive and and as a freelancer I think it we have an opportunity I mean it's the same in the working world but it's probably possibly a bit more difficult to implement. We have the opportunity to distinguish between busyness and productivity. I listened to an episode of the Ed Miliband podcast this week, Reasons to be Cheerful, by okay. Ed Miliband and Jess Floyd, and they were talking about um, the, the four-day working week and talking to some companies and business people who'd trialled this within their own organisations, and they, I think, were making a kind of a distinction, yeah, between productivity and not busyness necessarily but they're making a distinction between productivity and hours worked and it was really great actually to hear some people who are employers talking about how they are actually happy to implement a four-day week because their staff are more productive and because they have ways of measuring their output other than in hours right. worked so from a freelance perspective I guess yeah, you're right. We should. We all have that freedom all the time because we're generally not being paid in hours worked. We're right. You know, we're being paid what we can earn through different means. But if I quote somebody an amount which is based on a number of hours I think I'm going to put in, and then I do it in less, I probably aren't going to then go back to them and say, "Oh, I did it in less, so you don't have to pay me as much." I say probably because I'm actually a bit nice. <laughs> I'm a bit too nice. Unlikely that you might, but sometimes I do. Yeah, but. So yeah, I, a lot of the actually a lot of the time I'm just trying to get something done, and when it's done, yeah. I so it may sound like there's a contradiction here because we, we were talking earlier about having a fully scheduled week, which is obviously a certain number of hours. Mm -hmm. But then there'll be tasks within that that don't need to expand to fill the time. So if they're effectively done, that will leave time within that structured week to do things that you might enjoy more or want to do for mm. you, for yourself. Yeah, I find it intriguing the 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 distinction between work as a place to go and work as a thing to do, work as an activity. Uh, because m many people who are bound by a 9 to 5 schedule will think that as long as they're in work from 9 to 5, they are doing their job. Mm. It doesn't really matter what they are doing because they're paid to be there and therefore being there is enough to get paid. Um that's obviously very different from understanding why you're doing what you're doing and believing that you're doing it for a reason that is consistent with something personal to you. Mm. And if that's what you're doing, then your your work is an activity, not just a place to go. So society as a whole, I suppose, is moving very slowly away from this concept of work as a place to go. Mm. and maybe we are starting to think more about work as a thing to do but it's quite well it's the quite gig economy to gets those it's sort of connected with the gig economy isn't it which gets a very bad press but then that's you know with the, all the coverage we see of that 
is about people who are being forced into that kind of work yeah. whereas actually some of us have chosen that kind of work and it and we can make it work for us yeah absolutely because as you say we really want to do those things that we're doing well and i think i i keep hearing that the uk has a disastrously poor productivity rate so we might work a lot more hours than people in mediterranean cultures but we're much less productive mm. that and that's not evidence that the current system's working is it <laughs> have reached the final section of the podcast. I haven't yet come up with a name for this section. It's just on my notebook it's called stock questions. So I'll ask them to you and then if you okay. think of any suitable name for it you could share that with me. Maybe I will give it a name for future episodes. So the first question is uh, can you tell us about the most annoying or ridiculous thing that you've had to do this week because of being a freelancer? Um yeah, I think pretty much everything I've been doing this week is would sound ridiculous to a to a sane person. So um, I can give you a bit more context. Please do. Uh, because I'm a freelancer, uh, I'm self-funding a documentary. So the documentary I talked about is I, I've been making it for six years, but I don't have a company paying me to do it. So I've been crowdfunding this production phase. The the whole idea was that I would go to South Sudan to film the the latest production phase. So um, an American wheelchair basketball coach is going to South Sudan and in fact arrived two days ago and he's going to be coaching the national team in, in South Sudan. Yeah, Jess, the guy who's coming over to, to do the coaching and I have been in touch for the last almost a year um, talking about meeting up in November in South Sudan so that I can film him but it's November the team. I'm, we're gonna have to reveal to the listeners the millions <laughs> of them that we're recording this before it goes out it's November and you're not in South Sudan Richard. so yeah What's it's, happened? it's November and I'm not in South Sudan um, which is why the work that I've been doing this week has been somewhat challenging um, I applied for the government letter that I need to for to the precursor to applying for a visa um, a couple of weeks ago and I was turned down they they declined to issue me the letter of no objection to my travel to South Sudan, and I asked I asked why, and the only explanation they'd given in their decision was your reporting. So I've been to South Sudan many times before, mm. and as part of that, some of that has been filmmaking, and some of it's been reporting on the conflict and the humanitarian situation. There's been almost four hundred thousand deaths in South Sudan in the last five years. And I've done some reporting on that, and they don't they don't like it being reported. And so, it's harder as a journalist to get around things like that if you're freelancing. I've I've got another friend who um, was doing freelance photojournalism in India for quite a long time, and she came back here for a break to see her family, and then they wouldn't let her back in to the country. Right. And I gathered from chatting with her that it may well have been easier for her to get back in had she not been a freelancer. Um, okay. Because they were sort of cracking down on particularly British journalists um, going there. I think South yeah, Sudan sucks. seems to be cracking down on anyone that they can anyone find online. On. So they, they're, it seems like they're Googling journalist names and if right. they've written anything that talks about the conflict in a way that they're not mm. happy about, then they just refuse them entry. But the film is going ahead. Yeah, so the, <laughs> the good news is that I've recruited a, a brilliant team of, of journalists who are already there. Um, so, You're now doing and, remote... And they started filming uh, two days ago, or three days ago. So for the last couple of days, I've been remote directing. So sending them lists of the shots I'd like to get, lists of the people that I'd like them to meet, the interview questions that I'd like them to ask. And obviously, at every stage, there's that's moving forwards and I'm not there to know how it's moving forward. And so you can't having, even see what they've done. And I can't even see what they've done because the um, internet connection is not good enough to send footage so I'm gonna to have to wait till they've finished which is about another four weeks before I see anything and we can't talk on the phone because the phone lines aren't stable enough. You never know this is quite a fascinating exercise in like sort of blind directing for want of a better phrase yeah you might find out that it turns out to be an amazing technique and, <laughs> well, you, know, you want to use it in all your future work. I, can, I can only hope <laughs> it certainly makes me think in a more structured way because I need to know exactly what I'm looking for in order to explain it to the crew on yeah. a daily basis so it makes me be, it helps me think 
straight. It helps me be organized because I have to, because I have to explain everything that's in my mind to two other people. Oh, so you're looking on the bright side, but that is a bit annoying and ridiculous. So that's a very I, good I'm answer. just, I'm just really happy that the filming is still going ahead. Yeah. But yeah, it has yeah. its challenges. No, I'm glad, especially after all your fundraising. My ridiculous thing this week um, is that I feel like a, I'm basically some kind of donkey or cart horse. Um, I find that with being self-employed and with trying to build up my workload this year, I've had to kind of accept things that come my way, even if they're not on my doorstep. And I work up in Suffolk a lot anyway. So I thought, why not take this other job that is in Norfolk? If I, I was able to control the days slightly. So I've been spending one day a week in Suffolk and then the next day I go to Norfolk because I'm sort of halfway there anyway. But it means that I have to take kind of enough I have to take overnight things and different stuff for these because I'm sort of doing two different jobs on these different days and I need my laptop and I need a I have to carry a Bluetooth speaker around with me because I'm running workshops in you know village hall type places um, and then I've got all this other stuff to carry for this other job that I'm doing and I have this constant toss up between shall I pack it all into a backpack that I then can barely carry or shall I take a suitcase with me <laughs> everywhere which is really annoying if you're doing one job on the way to the next and you turn up everywhere the suitcase um, and it was all completely epitomized by me trying to get through the um, barriers at Liverpool Street with my absolutely enormous backpack and the barriers closed sort of behind me but before my backpack had gone through oh, no. and so I'm just standing there I was literally like strapped to the barrier of the chief station and I had to be rescued no doubt everyone around you was very patient oh, waiting for you to God. become unentangled so they could get through oh, no. yeah it was it was pretty ridiculous so but I thought hey I can use that for my podcast yeah. so, so that's my one for this week let's finish with happy things good things what has been the best thing this week about freelancing for you um yeah that's quite an easy one this week cause at about half past two yesterday afternoon i left the office and went to the natural history museum and Lovely. saw the um national wildlife photography competition oh, amazing. and which obviously i wouldn't have been able to do had i been in a yeah conventional Oh, those things are so busy if you go at the weekend, aren't they? Yeah, well, I did so. I, I did think that, oh, it's going to be really quiet. It's like 3pm on a th Thursday afternoon. It's going to be really quiet. It was uh, it was rammed. Oh, really? So, uh, Is it I only just open? Uh, it may also still be half-term in some places. There were lots of children. Maybe, yeah. Some it was half-term last half -term week. half-term this week in London, yeah. Is it half-term this week? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah I so, know some London teachers. Uh, I, so I, you chose bad, but... Yeah. But it was still good. But it was still, <laughs> it was still better than being At in the least office. You still did it, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It was, no, it was great. The photography was incredible. That's a great exhibition, isn't it? I have seen that a few times before. Fab. My best thing this week about freelancing has been saying no to some work that I didn't want to do. Okay. And I, it was actually last night, and I got an email through offering me some work, and it was about eleven o'clock at night, and I saw the email because I'm stupid, and I <laughs> looked at my emails at eleven o'clock at night, and I actually wrote. I started to write my reply saying, yeah, of course, because I'd looked in my diary and I'd gone, oh, I'm free then, I can do it. I got halfway through the email and I thought, what are you doing? Go to bed, sleep on it, think about it. You're free, but it's not actually very well paid work and it's not going to change your life in any way or get you other work in the future. I went to bed, I slept on it and I got up this morning and I sent the email going, no, thanks. You don't really, a, don't really want to do that. You had a clear idea of your priorities. Yeah. You knew why you were of. working and you chose not to do yeah, that. Yeah, well, it was, it was it's going to be spread over two days next week and they're kind of the only clear days that I've got to do other stuff which yeah fair enough I might not get paid by the hour for but that I want to do yeah so I yeah I made that shift from well kind done. of monetizing it to just saying what is it I want to be doing with my time yeah so yeah that's my it's my thing for today I have a suggestion for your segment oh yeah please do you could call it from the sublime to the ridiculous the sublime to the ridiculous. I like it. Okay, we'll implement that <laughs> on future episodes, or maybe retrospectively, depending on how much editing <laughs> I can be bothered to do. So, Fab, thank you very much. Good You're contribution. Welcome. Thank you very, very much for all your time, especially as you know you've clearly got your priorities straight. So I'm great, grateful for you blocking out a bit of time it's for us. My absolute pleasure. Good luck with the film, especially, and yeah, we'll try and get some people to. Have a look at it and to help you with your crowdfunding. Chuffed dot Chuffed.org. Chuffed.org. And the film's Brilliant. called Lions and Tigers. We'll put a link out. You can also find it at lionsandtigersfilm.com. 
fab. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Jenny. Bye. You've been listening to Properly Freelance with Jenny Elborn and my guest Richard Neald. My theme music is by Sarah Weiler and the podcast is supported by Impact Hub Brixton.